All right, so with us today from Germany, we have the athletics Oli Kane and also Tim Spears, who's recently returned from the Euros and he watched Ronaldo for us in the group stages as well. Oli, let's start with you. You know, you were in the Frankfurt Arena on Tuesday night for the, I guess, the Cristiano Ronaldo show. I think it should have been the Diego Costa show, but that's a different conversation. You've also written, you know, how astonishing it was to witness exactly what went on. How are you feeling about it now the dust has settled? I, I, I thought it was a fascinating evening in, in many ways. I, you know, I went there with the intention of not writing about Chris, Cristiano Ronaldo again because because you know this is this is a team. It's not just the Ronaldo show, and yet it very quickly became the Ronaldo show. I know I know the penalties, you know, the heroics from um, from uh, Costa, heroics from um, Jan Oblak at the other end uh, as well, but it, it ended up being the Cristiano Ronaldo show because we're talking about somebody who's you know, the most famous sportsman on the planet by almost any metric, and he seemed to have what was, it was almost like a breakdown on the pitch um, in the, in the, you know, he, he broke down into tears and, and um, after that, having that penalty saved in um, in extra time, he seemed he already. I mean, he started the game really well, looking really lively and uh, some good layoffs and looked much more in tune with the game than he had against uh, Georgia a few nights earlier. But it just, it, yeah, he clearly, clearly got much, much more frustrated. His shot selection became quite erratic. It was becoming a bit of a problem for his team. And then you think, well, he. He can't stay on here. They've got they've got to change it. And then um, then they got awarded the penalty. It was saved. It wasn't a bad penalty, but it was saved. And then this this moment where he, where he broke down in tears and then did almost nothing for the for the remainder of extra time. Which to me, I, I was watching it thinking they need to get him off. They need to get him off because he's he's no use to his team at the moment. Um, obviously, he did serve a purpose in that he came, at, you know, stepped up again courageously, you might say, and, and converted the penalty. But it was it was a, it was another occasion that just sort of leads you asking and asking yourselves more questions about Cristiano Ronaldo playing at the top level at the age of thirty nine in twenty twenty four. Nobody's disputing his brilliant career and his longevity, but does brilliance. Has his longevity sustained him at a level where he's still brilliant at the age of 39? I, I don't think it has. Yeah, Tim, you followed Portugal in the early stages of the tournament. You know, we spoke after the Czech Republic match. And, uh, you know, are you still surprised by how much attention Ronaldo still gets, considering we haven't yet in this tournament seen an end product? Uh, no, not really. I, th- I, feel like, I feel like the same question probably wouldn't be asked of, of Messi. Like... But but I don't know. It sort of feels like we view Ronaldo through a slightly different prism in in England, in that he's been a bit of a pantomime villain for like two decades now, um, which pro- probably stems from like you know right at the start. If you remember when he came over, he was he was never popular in in England um, with the the diving and the play acting and the the silly little hair thing that he had. Remember in like two thousand three, and then there was the Rooney wink. Of course, he was kind of viewed as like a a spoiled brat. Um, and then obviously what happened with Man United in 21-22 just sort of added to that. So, so yeah, my, but if, if you go across Europe, and yeah, I saw it sort of firsthand in in Germany, people are people adore him and they're fascinated by him. I, I think if most people in this country went to a Portugal match, they'd be surprised at just how prominent Ronaldo is in people's minds on the day. You know, obviously everybody wears his shirt, but everybody's sort of focusing on him in the warm-up, screaming when he touches the ball. People start filming. People whip their camera phones out when he's in possession and just start filming his 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 every touch. It's it's quite something. So no, I'm I'm not I'm not surprised at all by the attention he gets. I've got to say that the the tears thing was just one of the most. I think it'll go down as one of the most incredible moments in European Championship history. To be honest, to see um, one of the greatest players of all time. As Ollie says, break down like that. Um, you could sort of see it building up through the match. His facial expressions. I don't know if you. I don't know if they were showing him on the big screen, Ollie. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like the Karma Sutra of facial expressions. Basically, he went through <laughs> like everything. He was so anguished and pained. You know, even more so than usual. I do feel like um, perhaps we can attribute 
that to him knowing that the sort of end is nigh and increasingly desperate to stay in the limelight it must be hard to accept right your powers of your power you can't do what you used to be able to do he can't run as fast he can't jump as high and um, he can't score as many goals at this level than he used to it must be it must be hard to accept I've got to say, though, Ollie, you know, are we surprised that he still cares so much? Are we surprised that he has this, what I guess Jack Pitt Brooks said about Jude Bellingham, this sort of main character syndrome? When, <laughs> you know, Portugal are conducting a, a, a training session, 8,000 people turn up just to see Ronaldo. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, you talk about caring. There was a great quote from Roberto Martinez in the post match press conference where he said something like, he doesn't have to care this much. It was, it was something like that. The idea that it was sort of obscene how 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 much he cares. And look, he does care. He, he he's he's a diff. I mean, look, he, he he's desperate to win for his team. He's desperate also to win for himself. I don't think that I don't I don't think that sense of ego has done him any harm in his career. I think that's that's helped him make make him the brilliant career, brilliant player he has been, the brilliant career he's had. But I think. You could just see him, as, as Tim said, getting more and more upset and aggrieved and sort of raging at the injustice of it all as a free kick went, you know, maybe six inches over the bar or something like that. You could just see the change in his body language, which had started off really well in the game, um, where he just looked so agonised. And he's, he's always had that sort of tendency, but I, I feel like he went through a spell in his career where... Where he where he he started to um, manage his emotions better on the pitch and didn't get frustrated. It didn't get frustrated in the way he way he, he clearly did the other night. And I feel like it was that sort of mounting frustration, a mounting absolute obsession with wanting to score, that probably weighed so heavily on him and and and, and inhibited his performance and inhibited him. Uh, sorry, and inhibited his team. And I don't, you know, that that's not very helpful. So I think he's got to find a way of not obsessing over the goal so much, yes. not obsessing over scoring. But at the same time, you've got people like me pointing out that it's now uh, eight tournament games. People say about this this tournament, he he's only he's not scored in four appearances, but he also didn't score in his final four appearances at the World Cup. He's only goal in the last two tournaments came in the first game against Ghana at the last World Cup, a penalty. Mm. So since then, eight tournament games without a goal. Obviously, this could, you know, he could, being Ronaldo, he could score a hat-trick against against France. He's, he's that, he's that, That's always he's had that type right? of career. I, but I, at the moment, I, I don't see it. I, I see it as somebody who has, can no longer really be relied upon to do it. Also, Ali, you, 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 you say level. you say he shouldn't fixate on the goal, and yet, but if he doesn't score, you know, what's he there for, really? In, in terms of in terms of what he offers the team, he he must know that. You know, he has the fewest touches of any player every single game that Portugal play. Um, his build, his, obviously, his his link plays can still be very good, but in terms of his physicality and his speed, um, he hasn't got as much to offer as he used to. So, yeah, if if he doesn't score, you have to say, what's he there for? Mm. That's, I think that's a fair point. Do you think? Do you think? I mean, I could probably say this about the the last World Cup. Really, do, do we feel time has finally caught up with him, Tim? You look at someone, what five time Ballon d'Or winner, greatest goal scorer in international football. Is it time for us to accept that? As you said, those legs aren't there. That timing isn't there. That leap that we often see with those lovely headers isn't, isn't there anymore. You know, at this age, it's never going to be the same. Yeah, I mean, I remember writing about this on a few occasions during the 2002 2022 World Cup if I've just been dusting off my old articles IO and just just <laughs> just just put in Germany instead of Qatar because um, it it is it's, it's exactly the same argument as as 2 years ago obviously there were different circumstances then he'd just become a free agent uh having left man united he'd just done you know that interview with Piers Morgan he burned a lot of bridges and he wasn't in he wasn't in goal scoring form for anyone at that time for Portugal or for man united i think he'd gone eight of the previous nine without scoring for Portugal during 2022 and he'd only scored three for Man United in the first half of the season so it was much easier for, for Fernando Santos to drop him at that time here Martinez will constantly point to his goal record um, which is sort of uh, one in one 
for club and country during the past 18 months. But you look at the teams that he's played against, Portugal had the easiest group of any nation. It's not to diminish the fact that they won every game, but um, since since the World Cup, the highest ranked nation he scored against is was Slovakia, who are 45th in the world. The rest were like sort of 60 and below. Um, his last sort of, I guess, goal in a top level match is probably for Man United against sort of Everton, other than the penalty Oli mentioned against Ghana in the World Cup. Um, yeah, he scored three uh, in early 2022 against uh, FC Sheriff and Everton. So you, you're looking at two years really since he's scored in a top level match against good opposition. Um, the Saudi Arabian League, there was a report recently put it, which put it 27th in the world in terms of quality. Below the, I, I don't know how these things are measured, but you know it, it plays out when you look at who's in that league, and it, it was below the Cypriot first division in terms of quality. So yeah, he, he can. I was looking at some of the, the keepers he's been scoring against recently um, in Saudi Arabia. You know, there's a guy who's like 26 years old, a Saudi Arabian who's played 15 appearances in his whole career. Uh, there was another guy who's like 35 who's played in the Portuguese second tier for most of his career. So these are the standard of goalkeepers that he's up against as a small example. Um, so yeah, it's been some some time since he did it at the highest level, and that's fine. He's he's thirty nine, um, but I think his goal record is deceiving. And Martinez keeps pointing to that as justification for playing him. Whereas you look at Diogo Jota and Gonzalo Ramos scoring one in two at the top level, um, and I think there's a good argument to make that that they have something more to offer at this point in their careers. I guess Jota and Ramos have been injured technically last season, and Ronaldo, if you look at it. From those stats, he was in better scoring form than those two in general um, coming into well, this tournament. But then Ramos scored, I think, 18-14 at the end of the season for PSG. And yet, you know, when Portugal have already finished top of the group um, and played Georgia in their third game, you think, right, here comes, surely Ramos comes in for a game here or Jota. But no, Ronaldo starts again, which I, I found remarkable. As soon as I saw that starting lineup, you know, they've already finished top. They're not just through, they've already finished top. So that result was was irrelevant, really, and he experimented with his Martin has experimented with his team and his formation. But Ronaldo still played. As soon as I saw that, I was like, he's he's asked to play because he wants to score, you know. Um, so it, it, as Ali says, it doesn't mean he won't score against France. But you also look at Portugal sort of pandering to him in terms of the way that they play. So they've played ninety seven crosses from open play during this tournament. Portugal ninety seven. That's twenty nine more than anyone else. Now, of course, a lot of those are sort of low cutbacks and that's yielded sort of two, three goals. Uh, the first goal against the Czech Republic in the first game was a Vitinha cross, which sort of led to an own goal. The second one was a Neto cutback, which Conce South scored for the winner. And then uh, Bernardo Silva's goal against Turkey was from a Nuno Mendes low cutback. That's fine and it works for them, of course, with all the runners they've got coming into the box and the overlapping wing backs or full backs. But the high balls that they play to Ronaldo, they're either going under his head because he's because he's not timing his leaps right. Notice that quite a few times he's not timing his jumps. Or centre backs are uh, stood in front of him and clearing it first. And centre backs love knowing that crosses are going to be coming in aerially. You know, they, they know where it's going to, it's very predictable. So you've got to ask that question of Portugal that tactically they are pandering to him because he's in the team. Whereas if it was Jota or Ramos, they'd be playing a different way, which I think would suit them far better with the players they've got. I, 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 t I totally agree with that. And, and yeah, watching them the other night, um, the way Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva combine, it's it's very effective, very, very effective. They Those two have, have a really good understanding. And you would think that naturally they wouldn't, they wouldn't sort of be trying to sort of hang crosses up to the far post um, it, it, it's a different way of playing isn't it but there was one that where Bernardo Silva cut inside it was in the first half and curled in a what looked like an absolutely perfect cross which I think Pete Ronaldo would have buried uh, and he couldn't get to it and that's where I felt I, I felt he looked incredibly frustrated then so it's not insulted you know mo most most centre forwards of, of the past 20 years wouldn't have buried that chance, but I'm saying Peak Ronaldo would have done it, and I think Peak Ronaldo was so good that you're now looking at it. You know, I, I think he's now in the team on the reputation that he has built over over many time, uh, over many many years, and he just isn't able to do the same things. And and uh, I didn't think, you know, I, I thought some of his free kicks were were, were decent. Um, 
one of them definitely wasn't decent and you thought what on earth are you doing sh- shooting from there when your free kick record record is is poor why on earth are you shooting from that angle what gives you the right to think that this is the best chance Portugal have got to score but it's it, it's more the it's more the sh- lack of sharpness and lack of um yeah physicality whether it's leap or speed it just isn't the player he was so so you can i'm not saying Jota is definitely better or Gonzalo Ramos is definitely better but you can look you can look at them and say well there really should be a debate here about about whether he should be starting and i think one thing that might end up dictating this it probably won't but but it but it might is is that you know look yeah, um, England have, have played. Uh, England played on Sunday, and then their, their quarterfinals on Saturday. Portugal got a really tight turnaround Monday, Monday, and then Friday. And is and having played that all three group games, which others didn't, others sensibly were rested for the final group game, and then played 120 minutes when he didn't seem to have that in his legs on Monday night. Is he then ready to play? Um, to start against France and, and maybe play 90 minutes there or maybe play 120 minutes there. And look, being Ronaldo, being the kind of, you know, that main character <laughs> energy that Jack talk, cause, talks about with Bellingham, nobody would be surprised if he if he turns up with a big, big moment. But mm. I think you could look at it and say that rationally, whether it's from the start or, or from the bench, um, they should be looking at Jota or, or, or Gonzalo Ramos because he's... I, I don't feel like he's got... I don't feel like he can... Well, there was a time when everyone felt he was carrying this, carrying the Portugal, Portugal team, which I, I never really thought was true. I didn't think it was true in 2016, but it, but it was certainly true in moments. Whereas now it feels like they're carrying him. It's a brilliantly talented team with really talented players who I think would be one of the real favourites for the tournament if they had a centre-forward who enable them to play to their strengths. But I don't know, I'm, I'm sitting here hearing that saying, thinking, I mean, d- does Ronaldo need more praise? Does Ronaldo need lifting up anymore? Do people need to say how he great might, he might is? I mean, to the night. team. Yeah. yeah, true. To be fair, he's still a human being, a human being. But also, I, I guess what shouldn't be underestimated is the effect he does have on the players on that team. You saw when he was crying, they rallied around him, you know, mm-hmm. like literally holding him up as well. You know, he means a lot to this team, Oli. Yeah, I d- I, I thought it was quite interesting that when the penalty was missed or saved, let's be fair, you know he didn't miss the target; it was saved. I think only only Ruben Diaz immediately went running to him, and I, I think perhaps the because it was right at the end of the first period of extra time, wasn't it? I, and I think perhaps players didn't, the other players didn't really realise he was sort of breaking down in that manner, and. It was only real, really, in the in the huddle at, at, at half time and extra time when um, when you saw them kind of go, you know, well, I think it was Diego Dalot was was one of the main ones. Obviously, an unused sub, he's close to him from Man United days, and uh, Jao Palinha was was um, sort of hugging him close, and and Ruben Diaz the same. It's it's yeah, I I, I don't know. I I don't sense there's the same kind of warmth and awe towards him that you probably had with the Argentina squad and Messi at the last World Cup where you almost sensed that they were desperate to win for him. I don't I don't think the, the I think this Port, Portugal squad know that they're a talented lot and and that you know they've they've got really really good players and I don't think I don't think their hopes necessarily stand and fall on the form of Ronaldo in the way that that Argentina's did with Messi at the last World Cup. It, it's it's a different situation, and look, I don't think we'll be saying the same things about. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we'll be talking about Messi carrying Argentina at the next World Cup at the age of thirty nine either. I, I just think it's it's pretty much impossible to um, perform at, at that age. There's a reason why. There's a reason why, generally speaking, players aren't on on. on on playing centre forward for the for their national team at big tournaments at the age of thirty nine, it doesn't it doesn't tend to happen. Ronaldo's exceptional in terms of endurance, but I don't think he's this exceptional where you're still making exceptions for him at the age of thirty nine. I think they're probably like I think they're in awe of him more than more than anything. You know, I remember speaking to some of the players at Wolves about him, like uh, Neto, Neto Jota, Neves. You know, their faces light up when they when they talk about him. And there there are players in this 
squad that wouldn't be footballers without Ronaldo. I, I, I suspect, you know, look at someone like Francisco Conceição, maybe he's like, uh, what, uh, 18 years younger than Ronaldo. You know, he has changed, he has changed the culture of football in Portugal forever. Um, they sort of, yeah. Um, it's a two-way thing as well, though. I, I, I don't think he, he feels like he's, He's above them at all times in the dressing room and, and they all talk about advice that he gives them. You know, it can be an arm around the shoulder type captain. It's not like they're just staring at him like he's a waxwork in the dressing room, you know. Um, but yeah, I guess there are probably things that, that grate on them about him, like when he takes every single free kick, even though he's only scored one in 60 at major tournaments and, and points at his teammates to where to stand in a kind of a dismissive <laughs> fashion as he tends to do. Um, I mean, main or, character or, energy or what? I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, <laughs> but also... The way that he he constantly calls them out, right? Like when um, when Cancelo uh, didn't find with, with the own goal for the Turkey game, Cancelo didn't find him, and Ronaldo missed the goal because he was having one of his hissy fits and tantrums and looking in the other direction. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, so I can imagine that they get riled and annoyed by him as well. But in general, I would say there's more awe towards him, and also they probably feel they probably feel like I remember seeing this with Harry Kane at Spurs. They probably feel like they have to pass to him, you know, when he's when he's demanding the ball. And I remember when Kane left Spurs, you did see players like Son and Kulisevsky automatically free up and play their own game and do exactly what their instincts were telling them, rather than in, rather than just playing to Harry Kane. And that's not a slight on Kane or Ronaldo. I think it's just the, their status within that team leads to players to automatically look to them and to inspire them as well, by the way. Um, and that's why I think you see such a different team when Ronaldo doesn't play for Portugal, which doesn't happen very often. But the three games uh, in competitive football that he hasn't started in the last 18 months, uh, two of them, they won they won one 9 nil, albeit against Luxembourg. And the other was, of course, that 6-1 in the World Cup uh, against um, Switzerland when, when they played some phenomenal football. Hat-trick, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. So there, there is uh, a small pool of evidence there that um, yeah, they're, they're, they're fine for goals without him. Well, Oli, 20 shots at Euro 2024, zero goals. I mean, I guess there's no better stat to sum up what we'd probably say are his waning powers. Yeah, uh, but it's, you know, when you look at the shot map that, that, we, that we, um, we published on The Athletic the other day and it's showing ways taking shots from, some of them are from positions that, you, you just know he's not going to score from he, a couple of them not far short of the centre circle. That that free kick from um, um, sort of almost near the corner flag the other day. It's just you don't need to shoot from there. You're not. You, you've probably got a better chance of scoring. Well, your team has, but you have a better chance of scoring if you stand in the middle with your aerial presence and power and wait for someone like Bernardo Silva or Bruno Fernandez to. You know, send across and it's 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 the choices of of when to shoot and he's always he's always taken loads of shots, loads of shots. But to return to something Tim said earlier in the conversation, I've, I've looked at this uh, over the over the last six months or so. And there are there are games in Saudi Arabia where he he'll take twelve thirteen shots, which is an incredible number to take in a game. And you can you can afford to do that if you're playing in a team that's dominating against vastly inferior opposition. You can afford to do that if you're playing against Liechtenstein or, or Luxembourg in a, in a um, European Championship qualifier. You can't really afford to do that if it's a really tight um, game at the Euros against a you know a decent team and a decent goalkeeper, where you where you're shooting from way out and look uh, he forced. Oblak into some decent saves as well as the penalty, but they weren't. He wasn't really extended by them. I mean, you know, when when Ronaldo gets a free kick on target and Oblak saved it, you, you think, well, yeah, okay, that's you, you've tested the goalkeeper, but it wasn't. It wasn't like he was. It wasn't like a brilliant free kick. It, it's it, it's it's the shots. It's the number of shots he's taking. The the fact that he's getting more and more wound up with everyone that doesn't go in. And it's also the ones that that he doesn't take or isn't able to get to, which you know the Ronaldo of previous years would have done. That that, that Bernardo Silva cross I mentioned, and it's just he, he doesn't he doesn't seem to be the the great goal scoring threat that that you would expect him to be. Well, you wouldn't expect him to be age thirty nine, but 
he was still a goal scoring threat age 35 at the last or 36 at the last Euros but I think you can look at his career trajectory and say it was already declining by then but it's it, it's declined further since then and when people t- when I'd say about peak Ronaldo I'm talking about nearly well perhaps a decade say between 2011 and 2016 I think that's that's peak Ronaldo it's a really long time ago it's a really really long time ago in terms of somebody who's now still still playing now age 39 and yes it, it's a testament to his powers and longevity and everything else commitment professionalism physique that he's still playing but he's he's nothing like the player he was at. quickly you can also question you know the, the best players adapt to their change in physicality as they get older they change their style maybe they'll come deeper you know like like someone like Rooney did but is, is Ronaldo doing that I'm not sure really he's almost sort of painting himself as like I know the the big man the big man off the bench option if all they can do is chuck crosses at his head he's basically veg horse right just just um but <laughs> what I would really don't compare Ronaldo to veg horse that I've will come it. for you <laughs> I've done it Clip it up, stick it out on socials, that's fine, I'll take it. <laughs> um, but like, I'd also be interested to know, can Martinez drop Ronaldo? Is he allowed to drop Ronaldo? You know, he, had, he had the chance to, to ditch him after when he, when he was appointed. It was, it was a very clear argument to say, look, he's just been dropped at the World Cup. He's just moved to Saudi Arabia, a massively substandard league. You know, he's, he's, what, 37 at the time, two years ago. Martinez could have come in very clearly and said, look, this is a new era. I'm the new manager. We've got Jota, Ramos, whoever, we can drop him. But he either chose not to do that or he wasn't allowed to do that. And that, that's that's the big question now going forward. Can, is, can he drop Ronaldo? Is he allowed to drop Ronaldo? Yeah. And this guy's got 630 million Instagram followers. You know, it's even more than, even more than Oli. He's got like, he's, he's, big, he's bigger than, but he's bigger than clubs. Real Madrid have got 130 million Instagram followers. And Mbappe's got about the same. You know, he's, he's three times four or five times as many as popular as any other player at the Euros. Mm. Um, he is like a club into himself. He does have his own fan base. You know, you, the, the match shirts you see with his with his name on, he's got this this sort of fanatical fan base, which we've seen a glimpse of at the Euros with all these selfie pitch invaders, which is like nothing I've ever seen before, to be honest. I don't know, again, if Oli, if you've experienced this on social media, but, you know, the Ronaldo fans, they are... Yeah, they're, they're, they're like nothing I've ever come across from any club. I've, I've upset a few clubs' fan bases in my time, but no, no, none of them have you come try, for me. You try upsetting Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, so I, I mean, the, the BBC posted something the other day about him missing a penalty and they, they had to change a caption, but even posts now that are irrelevant to the Euros, the Ronaldo fans are still telling the BBC to apologise for the post they put up about Ronaldo, which was slightly degrading towards Ronaldo. So yeah, those fans are, you know, they, they love him deeply, but let's get back to the football super quickly um, in terms of, you know, this Portuguese team um, and how they're playing. You know, you've got all these incredible players, as, as Liam touched on. Great passing ability. This team is absolutely stacked, Oli. Does having Ronaldo as the focal point of this team inhibit certain players like Bernardo Silva, like Bruno Fernandes, like Conceição, to really express themselves? Um, I think it, it just it probably just narrows their options when 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 they're approaching a penalty area and, and, and they feel like what we have to do now is is serve it up to the far post or to the six yard box where Ronaldo may or may not win a head. Uh, that that feels like that has become their their main tactic for scoring a lot of the time. And when you look at the type of interplay that that they're capable of and, and Vitinha as well, I think he's he's a he's a very very technical player and and. Rafael Leao, um, Bruno Fernandes, Bernardo Silva, the, the fullbacks getting forward. It's a really, you know, it's a really, really technical team. I mean, you could you could say the model is a little bit like Manchester City with with Haaland, but I think Haaland is um, a much more deadly, um, unforgiving, ruthless finisher. Uh, a you know at, at this point of his career than the than Ronaldo is. You can't, you couldn't imagine Ronaldo being in the. Manchester City team and, and scoring the number of goals Haaland does but it, it's yeah I I feel that the strengths of this Portugal team would be um, better served by a more mobile forward who would give them more sort of fluency cohesion in possession and 
and an, and a, a sort of sharp edge, which Jota Jota does. I think Jota's looked really good when he's come on, um, and particularly that that game the other night. And he, he won the ball back sort of near the, near the halfway line and slipped a beautiful pass through to Ronaldo. Um, it doesn't have to be either or, but it feels like the team is set up to get the most out of Ronaldo rather than the mo- the most out of the rest of the players, and that that, that concerns me because. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. Yeah, if you look at Roberto Martinez at the last World Cup, and I, I, I think he's a really good coach. I think he gets really um, unfairly derided in, in in this country because you know Wigan got relegated. Well, that's not a big shock. Everton didn't win anything. Well, that's not a big shock either. But it's, you know, I, I feel like he's a really good coach. But he's one who, to my mind, has been compromising his principles a bit with with Ronaldo, but also. When I think of the last World Cup, and he sort of indulged Eden Hazard at a point where Eden Hazard was just not able to cut the mustard anymore, and was was uh, you know he was I think it was about twelve months away from retiring, um, and others in that team, and he didn't you know he, he didn't really make that change until it was too late. He seemed in awe of Eden Hazard, and I feel like look. Ronaldo is is a great asset to have in the squad. I I think if if Portugal get all the way to the final, he's going to play a big part in that. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily have to be by playing every minute of every game and being the focal point of everything. I, I think I think changing it, I think changing it on Monday night would have given Portugal a better chance of resolving it in in normal time or extra time without going down to the uh, nerve wracking penalties. And I feel. You know, we're saying this before they play France on Friday. I could be proved wrong, but I feel they would have a better chance of beating France if they, if they have Jota or, or Ramos up front, personally. I mean, is this as much about optics as well? Uh, if Portugal go through without Ronaldo in that starting lineup or playing an influential part in that team, does it look a bit odd as the, 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 the main man in Portugal? I mean, yeah, it was an interesting point about it's his last game at the Euros, but I don't know, it's not like he's announced he's going to retire. It's not like it's not like Gary Lineker in 1992 where, you know, Graham Taylor's got to bring him off for Alan Smith after 70 minutes and then that's it, career over. And it, OK, it's so the Euros, it's it's big, it's massive, but it's not the World Cup. Um, I don't know, I, I, from Martinez's point of view, surely if you want to avoid that decision, which he hasn't in three of the four matches he's played. He's played him every single minute, apart from the Georgia game when he brought him off after an hour. But otherwise, he plays every single minute. Surely you'd want, you, you, to avoid sort of hauling him off, you'd rather have him on the bench to send him on. And then you could say, look, well, yeah, we threw Ronaldo on for the last 20 and we still couldn't get through. If he's really desperate to avoid those accusations. But equally, so what? He's the manager. He's, he's there to make tough decisions. You know, that's what Fernando Santos did in the World Cup last time. And, and it paid off with that, with that 6-1 win against Switzerland. So... Yeah, I feel like Martinez, if he can, should be ignoring all that noise and just, yeah, it's, it's, it, maybe it's easy for us to say, but shouldn't he just be selecting the best 11 to win that game? And if you're going to beat France, you're going to have to try and pull that defence apart uh, with movement, with combinations, with one-twos, with smart running. And yeah, I think there are probably better placed players to do that. Um, I'd, I'd, I can see Ronaldo being a far more benefit coming on for the final 10 minutes if they're... 2-1 down or locked at one all and yeah that's when you're throwing crosses into the box um, but I still yeah f- f- for everything that we're saying here I'd, I'd be stunned if he doesn't start yeah it, it, is it tricky though to step away from what you've already done in a tournament for a game of such magnitude um, because as you said Tim previously you know Gramos, Jota and hey, we've even forgotten about Jao Felix as well can offer a, a, an extra dimension to that team as well yeah, but it's it's not it's not working. You know, they 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 couldn't score against Slovenia for 120 minutes. They couldn't score against Georgia for 90 minutes. Or a bit with a weakened team. They really struggled against Czech Republic in their first game. You know, they were losing until uh, like 60, 70th minute and required a stoppage time goal. And then Turkey, that was definitely Turkey's weakest performance. And Turkey rested a couple of players that day. So, yeah, this is going to be by an enormous margin, by an enormous margin, Portugal's toughest. Uh, game of the tournament so far they're going to have mm. to raise their levels um, whether they're capable of doing that with Ronaldo in the 11 I, I don't know 
Uh, Ollie, I'd be interested if if you if you we're, we're all kind of agreeing here that he probably shouldn't start. If you had to make a case for him to start, having been at the Slovenia game, what what would you say in terms of what Ronaldo can actually bring to the team and is good at still? I I, I thought the first half hour he looked really, really really sharp and um, looked like he looked like you know a man on a mission. And look, he always looks like a man on a mission, but but he looked like somebody who was likely to he looked like he was likely to score. He had a goal threat. In the first half hour of that game, his link-up play was was good. In the first, I, I don't think it was sort of Jota type link-up play, but it was good. It was good link-up play, um, and yeah, I I think you, you look at the aerial threat. You look at the fact he's a proven goal scorer, and you can also sort of, I mean, look, he's not he's not Mick Harford, but it's he can rough he can he, he Billy Whitehurst. Um, Google that one, kids. He he, he can he can. It's not. Roughing up defenders, but he occupies defenders. He, he he gives them a difficult time, and sometimes there can be a sort of easy second ball for somebody else to go for. But I feel like we're talking about that type of threat, and a threat with penalties, and you know some anything that might drop in a six-yard box, rather than being this sort of genius that people might recognise from you know YouTube show reels of things that mostly happened. Sort of between ten and twenty years ago, it's it's oh, you know no set six seven and and twenty years ago, it's he's 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 still a, he's still a handful he's still a goal threat, but I just don't feel like his goal threat is um, of a type that gives Portugal the best chance of making the most of these players, and I do feel the one the one issue with him is. Uh, the, the, the one question mark I have um, about this game is is just that that, that short turnaround, the Monday Friday turnaround when he's when he's played, you know, 120 minutes and he's played uh, most of the most of the Georgia game and he's played more more minutes than any of the other outfield players in that squad. I, I think I'm right in saying. Yeah. So you might be looking at it and thinking, well, he's just not he's not 100. He might he might not be 100 percent fit going into this game. Who knows? And if he's not just be prepared to take him off or put him on from the bench. He, 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 if he's not capable of being at it for 90 minutes, then give him 60 minutes, give him 30 minutes. But don't be so enthralled to him that he stays on the pitch when, to my mind, in, in extra, by, the, by the time extra time came around on Monday night, he was, he was offering nothing. And yeah. I, thought it was, I thought it looked quite weak for Martinez to keep him on in that situation. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, in fairness to Ronaldo, uh, you could say the likes of Bellingham, Kane, maybe Mbappe haven't hit their heights this this tournament either. But um, final one for the both of you. Um, assuming Ronaldo does start um, against France, and we've touched on it earlier, and he ends up scoring, you know, main character energy and all that. Are we going to revise our thoughts on whether he's passed it or not? Because it is very likely that he come, he does something in that game, right? It is still Cristiano Ronaldo. There is still a magic there. Um, I, 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 I think I think the end is nigh. Whatever happens, right? I th- and, uh, but no, but I think he, I think he knows that. I think he knows that. I think that I think that's that's probably playing into be, playing into his behaviour. Um, he might have decided to retire for all we know, you know, and, and keeping it quiet. Hence, hence why he's, he's so erratic and so emotional. Um, look, this is my talented group of players that Portugal has probably ever produced in their entire history. I don't think he's in the team on merit. And Oli makes a really good point about it. it's it's the fact that he's it seems like he's not allowed to, to be subbed or he's not allowed to be dropped. That's why we're doing this podcast, I think, because it seems like it's it's un it's unjust. Um I think it's over and he knows it. I don't think his legacy's been damaged. I don't think it ever will be really, no matter how many sort of years he goes on. The goals, the numbers you know, in, in 50 years' time, he'll still be in the top 10 players of, that have ever played football, I think. We can guarantee that. Um, I, I, I just, I, I felt at the World Cup that his time was over at the top level. Nothing he's done in the last 18 months has changed my mind. Um, in fact, m- maybe his legacy has been damaged because in this podcast we've compared him to uh, Vekhorst and Mick Har- and, and, and Mick Harford, most damnly of all. So, yeah. <laughs> If you're listening, Cristiano, maybe it's time to time to pack it in, mate. No, no, no. It, it's. <laughs> I mean, in terms, in terms of the legacy question, it's surely the legacy is extended by the fact that he's still playing in tournaments in 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 
you know, at the age of 39. Yeah. Uh, make Making history, scoring, what is it now, 130 international goals, which, look, admittedly, most of the last, you know, most of the goals over recent years when his scoring record has gone like that at international level have been against you know, Liechtensteins, Luxembourg's, San Marino's, Andorra's, Lithuania's, whoever's. It, it, it's not... It's not something that's it doesn't underline brilliance, but the longevity and, and the numbers are just incredible. But I, I just I was just watching. You know, I, I was there at the, the match of the night and seeing like all these sort of kids of seven, eight, nine, ten, wearing Ronaldo shirts, and they've so they they've grown up with the idea that oh he, he's 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 incredible. They they've never seen anything like peak Ronaldo. They, 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 they've they probably the first World Cup they might remember is would be twenty twenty two when he didn't you know he scored that one penalty and was cut a very frustrated figure for most of it he's cut a frustrated figure for this so it's it, it's to me it, to me it's kind of quite amazing that the, the 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 phenomenon of Ronaldo is so strong that kids who have just never seen him be they, they they've never watched football at a time when he's been one of the top 10 players in the world which uh, which at his peak he was you know he was it was sort of neck and neck at times with Messi as to who, who was the greatest and um, in, in individual years he, he's he's had an incredible career absolutely incredible career but these these do feel like the you know the sort of end days of it and, and yes it's it's not a case of saying, oh, is this maybe a tournament too far? I think the World Cup seemed a tournament too far. This feels like two tournaments too far. But at the same time, it would not surprise me one little bit if he just has this moment. And it might it's probably most likely to be a, a penalty if that happens, because it feels like his threat is being reduced to that in some ways. But it's it, it wouldn't surprise me just because he's 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 Ronaldo. He's kept coming up with these moments but they've been fewer and further between in terms of top level games over the last few years and it's um yeah I, I, it's fascinating I, I i do think probably his best chance of having that moment against france is probably coming off the bench because other, otherwise i can't see him being on the pitch for 120 minutes or 90 minutes all right let's call it there cheers gents really appreciate your time ollie and Tim as well. Now, if you're after more from the Euros, remember to check out the Totally Football Show. And also, our daily football briefing brings you all the news from both the Euros and Copper America inside 10 minutes throughout the summer. We'll be back tomorrow for a deep dive into the one of the day's biggest stories. As always, thanks for listening. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.